aisles stacked into 352 meters of shelving. These are from a pre-digital world. Every plan, purchase order, design decision placed on paper. Over a million pages of which nearly 400,000 are letters and faxes. It's a paper trail from an epic process, a single architectural project. There is human drama here, conflict and collaboration. A discussion about a staircase that went on for over a year. The name on the files is David Chipperfield. The project is the Neues Museum in Berlin. Few buildings are more symbolic of the history of Germany in the last century, but its restoration has transformed it into something more powerful, more affecting than anyone could have imagined. A new building created from the remains of the old, a fusion of past and present, and a moment in architecture that will be remembered long into the future. I don't know any architect who hasn't been to the Neues Museum and felt it was a masterpiece. To spend 11 years on a museum in Berlin, to go through the drudgery, the bureaucracy, the sense that everyone is trying to stop what you're doing, to go through all that and still keep an idea alive, that is a remarkable achievement. When you walk around them, you think, but this is the work of, of madmen for a whole century. You know, including the architect. And I just think that's so powerful. I mean, it changes you going to that building. Chipperfield is one of the few architects in the world who can create a cocktail of conservative, almost a classicism, and a very crisp modernism. I think he's trying to cultivate a conversation, not just within the office, but within a wider society. He's a very articulate architect. The work begins with words, in a way. But he lets beautiful materials, great spaces, and light do the talking for him. I don't think he's trying to change the world other than to make it a more civilized place. Sir David Chipperfield, CBE, Royal Gold Medalist, Sterling Prize winner is among the most admired and sought-after architects in the world. Earlier this year, he was chosen to design a new contemporary wing for that temple of culture, New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Commissions don't come more prestigious than this. What's more, the new building will replace the current galleries which face onto the hallowed ground of Central Park. He's come a long way from the frock shop in Sloan Street, which began his career. To visit David Chipperfield in his office, you ascend a slightly tatty 60s office block from a windswept corner next to Waterloo Station. This is how you might imagine an architect's office should be. Space and light, tables for meeting and eating, where even the tableware is designed by Chipperfield for the Italian design house, Alessi. And have you noticed no computers, only models? And they are everywhere. The physical model in our office remains the tool of exploration and communication. I will only look at projects through physical models because I think it, it, it gives us something to talk about as a third person. This is the Met. The project is that we, t we take this away, even though it was built in the 80s, uh, and build a new, a new building. And so you can see all of these different iterations which have been going on through the competition stage of nearly a year, and now we're in the uh, concept stage again of developing a, the project. So, you're, so even though they, they commissioned you, that dialogue continues with the... With the yeah, it starts again. Since we've become much more digital in every aspect of life, I think this physical presence of buildings has a lot more power. In David's buildings, there's rarely a single image. 
It's more complex. Um, it's not a one-liner. I think David Sheffield buildings don't come and grab you. You have to sort of enter into his world to get it. I've seen it happen before. In a month down, I said, but why was that stair there? Well, it's, I thought it had to be there. Just got to be careful that it doesn't become a wrong piece of information. So this is your eagle's nest here. You're surrounded by the London that you, well, I won't say, what the London that you what? Well, there is, a, there is something sobering when you sit here and you discuss architecture and you stress about a staircase or a plan or something small and then you lift your head up and you look at that and you think what's the important thing is designing a, a staircase have any relevance compared to designing a city you know i mean what's architecture for that's my worry what what, what are we doing as architects we're leveraging value on projects with, where value can be leveraged architecture is always dependent on investment but at the moment Investment is a sort of wild beast. The money that's coming here isn't just no. from someone walking down the street and saying, oh, that's a nice site. Maybe, you know, I could go to the bank and raise some money and develop it. It's global money hovering around trying to find a place to land. London has changed dramatically since Chipperfield started out as a young architect, working in the offices of both Norman Foster and Richard Rogers. There was still a heroic social aspect to the modern architecture of the high-tech era. Richard and Norman both had strong social. utopian yes. background. I mean, I think the Pompidou Center is the last great utopian building. Willis Faber, you know, which I used to take people around as a you know, member of the office, is a, one of the great office environments, very socially inventive. We came out of school with a completely different expectation. Sitting in Richard Rogers' office with 12 people after he built Pompidou, you think, well, if, if you if built Pompidou and that's all, and that's all you, I mean, what chance for the rest of us? Salvation came in the shape of a shop. I remember talking to one of my professors who was a you know, university builder, I just couldn't believe it. I was going to design a shop. Why would I humiliate myself? And I just thought, well, this is the best chance I've ever seen. The Miyaki job was a quiet building. It was beautifully done, very polished, very elegant, very minimal. And you could call what David was doing sensual, born again modernism. It was a different take. His shops were incredibly simple, and he was trying to focus people's perception of the store on the little shifts you can do at that scale. You know, whether it was change of materials or change of levels, etc. Rather than selling the shop as a kind of a market. The success of Issey Miyake's store led to more stores and to more work in Japan. Japan became a huge patron for a whole emerging generation of sort of radical young architects. A country which had its own indigenous avant-garde architectural culture. And David benefited from that. It's his first two or three standalone buildings all built in Japan. And those buildings were often built in urban contexts which were very poorly defined or sometimes even rather hostile. And they have the character of castles when I look at them. They seem kind of fortified as if they're turning in on themselves and very preoccupied with an interior space and an interior kind of passage of movement. So they become these sort of worlds unto themselves. Japanese culture seemed to value an appreciation of simple things, clean lines, the everyday made special. It allowed Chipperfield's space to be modern. I was hired for three weeks to help on a Japanese competition and I stayed for eight and a half years. And those first five years, David struggled it was very hard. The very few people in Britain were interested in contemporary things. Chipperfield's breakthrough in England occurred when he won the competition for the Museum of River and Rowing in Henley-upon-Thames. 
a town where modern architecture was regarded with suspicion. At some point, one of the planners said, you just have to think, would Prince Charles approve of this? And I said, hang on, this is not the criteria on which planning applications should be considered, but in a way it was then. And I think architects had underestimated the, the need for the familiar as well as the strange. In this case, the touch of the familiar was the inclusion of a pitch roof in the design. I realized if I didn't do a pitch roof, I'd have no chance. And actually, it was shortlisted for the Mies van der Rohe Prize. And uh, gossip had it that Prince Charles, it was one of his favorite modern buildings of you know, that time, which I probably shouldn't boast about too much. No, but, don't boast but why not? I mean, in a way, and, and it became a fun, you know, one liked the building. He did have a pretty hard time from, among others, the Evening Standard, which launched a crusade to stamp out Chipperfield in London. Partly it was to do with this house for Nick Knight, the photographer. To me, it's a modestly scaled, quiet, sensitive addition to the street, a street which I've been to characterized by militant pebble dash and half timbering. And I think it actually contributed to David's slight paranoia about the British press and a sense that people were out to persecute him. The lack of uh, reception for his work uh, did form him to some extent. I think there was a, an ever so slight bitterness, if I can say that, and a, that fostered a kind of determination that you see later, a kind of steeliness that you see in his work. He is absolutely determined to do things the way he wants to do things. One of his early clients, converts even, was the sculptor Anthony Gormley. We go to work in a David Chipperfield studio. We live in a house that David helped us convert, and we eat with David Chipperfield knives and forks. So we genuinely do uh, depend on David Chipperfield for our, as it were, external body. The brief that we gave David was space, light, and silence. But there was immediately this understanding about material and about volume that absolutely caught Vicken and I um, as being somebody who understood about the relationship between light, material, and space. You could say that is what architecture is. It is bare architecture. That bareness is put at the service of human life. So that life itself, the way that human bodies occupy his spaces, is its decoration. And uh, I respect and admire the way that David has upheld that notion of, in a way, the humanity of architecture. Throughout the 90s, work of any note in Britain was hard to come by. And the place where David Chipperfield came to feel most at home was Berlin. It's always intriguing to see what architects build for themselves. And in David's case, this was the place to be. In a typical Berlin courtyard, there are a group of simple concrete buildings. He has an apartment on the street side so you could say he lives above the shop. I love his own house in Berlin. I love that. I, I mean, I think that's a kind of a dream house. There's a canteen which is open to the public. And at the back, offices occupy what was once a piano factory. David's architecture begins with the city. And that's a very different way of working from most celebrity architects today who really are driven by the idea of architecture as an image. Sharing this philosophy, there are now around 200 architects working for Chipperfield, with offices run by directors in Milan, Shanghai, London, and of course, Berlin. When we go for lunch and we see people coming from outside, people from inside sitting there in the sun enjoying their lunch. Even other architects. <laughs> Even other, uh, that's the biggest reward. <laughs> architects from across the street. I mean, how much can you get? <laughs> Hosting events, entertaining, 
mixing clients, neighbours, friends and above all artists. Bringing people together is clearly important for David and his wife Evelyn. I think she's had a very strong impact on bringing out the Europeanness in, in David. She's managed to create a kind of um, not exactly a salon culture, but there is a circle around the Chipperfields. There's a sense of creating a conversation around them. Tonight's discussion is all about the city, with his friend, the artist and photographer, Thomas Struth. The picture I had of architects was quite negative. I, I thought whenever I met an architect, they were pretty arrogant, and, and I always felt that they are mostly vain and... and, uh, and <laughs> I think we get the picture. But Chipperfield has proved himself to be an architect who listens, and that makes his a voice to be taken seriously in the debate about the future of Berlin. And it all began with the Neues Museum. The Neues Museum was an amazing project for us, and it, it put us very much in into the middle of it is, you know, a reflection and a discussion about Germany, German history and German, and about Berlin, how the city should. So, you know, as the city's forming, trying to deal with past and future, the Noise Museum was seen as, as a valuable contribution to that discussion. And you were doing it from 97 until, it took you how many years to... to... The first competition we started in 94, the first round was 94. So we started thinking about that project five years after the war came out. Did you see this as something to help bring Germany and Berlin together? Bring the, did it, did, was this at one part of the project? I was only an architect. I didn't. Oh, come on. Chipperfield's campus is in the Mitte district, once part of East Berlin. It's a mixed area with Plattenbau, the concrete prefab blocks so characteristic of a GDR, just at the end of the street. David says he loves the neighborhood because it has room for the unexpected. Today, that includes a visit from film director, Wim Wenders, who's joining us on a walk through the city. So, our common what? neighborhood. You live near here. I just live up there. around the corner. I can look into the shower. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a sort of anti-Wim curtain on our shower because because when they found out I could see them taking a shower they got scared yeah. <laughs> in the aftermath of the Second World War when the reconstruction of Berlin began it soon became clear that two distinct cities were emerging the division between East and West was made concrete by the building of the Berlin Wall but were you from the east or the west? You were from the west. Right? I'm from the west, but the first thing I was, was moving here because I thought it was so much more interesting. Wenders was in Australia when the wall came down. Like many of the rest of us, he watched it on TV with its news reports of Stasi archives and banana shortages and close encounters with that symbol of the east, the Trabant. Friends of mine whose parents had ordered one a couple of years before the wall fell down, and they were delivered the car after the wall fell down, and nobody wanted them anymore. <laughs> they got that turban a year too late. <laughs> so you were sort of working across with people in East Germany. Yeah, I had friends and knew some directors and stuff, but we couldn't really work here. You see, mm. for Wings of Desire, I tried very hard to shoot in East Berlin, and they wouldn't let me. They wouldn't. No, they wouldn't let me because they made a movie without a script and they didn't. But they were afraid about what Yeah, they were afraid. Wenders' angel's eye view looks down upon Berliners of the divided city. The pattern of courtyards revealed is a survival from the 19th century, but it still helps to make Berlin what it is today. The courtyard system is a fairly unique Berlin typology. It's a way of getting more density into the center. Yeah. You couldn't get more dense in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Look, here, yeah. you can see all the way. Oh, yeah. See, and I, some are very regulated, like you were, no kid was allowed to play. And you still sometimes see the signs, no playing and no 
no cleaning of carpets and oh, really? yeah well i suppose that what they felt they had to be rules yeah yeah because it germans rules. love rules do they <laughs> they invented all the rules we could have picked a nicer day yeah that was alan's fault funny to get to see your own city like this so now we come to one of the landmarks in one of my favorite places this is one of the last remaining dance halls there's dancing still every night of the week so funny huh? This has all been stage managed by them. I mean, like, this is the film set. It's not for real, I'm sure. <laughs> There's a Berlin factor that heightens the meaning of things. You scratch the surface and you find history. These photographs were taken in the mid-70s, at the height of the Cold War. This dance hall is a Berlin survivor. So many stories, so many ghosts. This becomes very nostalgic and in a way unsustainable, but on the other hand, it's a shame that the texture of East Berlin has been lost, and then you've got to hold on to it through something like this, which is, in a way, an unsustainable level of dilapidation. I love this place. And you can still play soccer in the middle of the city. But this is what a city should be like, hmm? Destruction and dilapidation have defined Berlin, a legacy of the war and the wall. There was one grand public building in the heart of the city which remained a ruin for over 50 years, the Neues Museum. It was designed by neoclassical architect August Stüler for King Friedrich Wilhelm IV of Prussia. It was a way of affirming power through art when it was built in the 19th century, the 20th all but destroyed it. It was bombed by the Allies, pockmarked by bullets and shrapnel, as the Red Army took possession of the city and left to rot during the GDR. The weight of all this history would eventually fall on the shoulders of this quietly spoken Englishman. The restored Neues Museum today looks at a distance like what it was meant to be, an evocation of classical Greece transported to Berlin. But look closer and you can see the scars of history. They're there because of a decision taken not to restore, but to keep clean and repair the fabric of the building that survived. To treat it in effect like the fragments of a precious Greek vase. Some spaces required dramatic intervention. The grand staircase hall linking the three stories of the museum had been bombed right through to the basement. It would need something special from the architects to live up to what had been lost. This is quite a bold proposition. Well, in a way, that's what we felt. And we, yeah. what, interestingly, all alternative ideas didn't work with the room. And then you realize that the room and the stair are dynamically integrated this mm. diagonal experience of the space leading to the light this one coming up to this light it, we just couldn't get anything else to be as convincing preservation of the ruin meant listening to all its stories the fabric showed the scars of war and in one corner the walls were blackened by fires from the battle for berlin when the women and children of the city were among the last left to fight against the advancing russians did you have to look at each of these areas and these spaces and think, well, what's the story here? Why is this here? Why should we keep it? Should we not keep it? Is that what you did? It's a detail and it's hidden there. And then you, just at the second glimpse, you realize suddenly where it comes from. Yeah. And that's it. At the concept stage, not all Berliners were convinced. Some continued to demand full restoration. A campaign was mounted against the Chipperfield plans. Watercolors showing the polychromatic glories of Stüler's interior were compared 
to stark concrete. There was a confrontational atmosphere. The, the, the citizens almost rose up. But Chipperfield, interestingly, didn't see that as a problem. He saw that as a, as a wonderful opportunity. It meant that the, the citizens were interested in what's going on. And once people are passionate and interested, then they become involved in the process. And it, it was a dialogue in a way that I think a lot of, uh, a lot of other buildings are not. The starting point for the process was an analysis of a ruin by Julian Harrop, the conservation architect. We'd be involved in actually trying to give, if you like, a rating to each piece of fabric. And it might go from utter and total deconstruction, wrecked walls, missing brickwork, and then it might move along to a point at the other end of the room where you've got wall paintings in almost perfect condition. And so this idea of graduating each space according to its components was fundamental. The dialogue around the building extended to craftsmen, conservators and contractors, all dedicated to the same brick-by-brick problem-solving that was becoming an adventure in architecture. There was some stereotypical Germanic precision involved too. The concrete pieces are enormous, but they are produced um, with an incredible precision. They have five millimeter joints, and if you imagine five millimeter, and they have plus minus one millimeter, and if you go 10 meters like that, four meters up, and then plus minus one, this is very precise, almost Egyptian, I would say. Stiller's original museum changed themes and structure from room to room. Greek, Egyptian, vaulted, columned. It gave the architects license to change their approach room by room in response. The museum's curators and directors were part of the conversation. The collection to be displayed influenced decisions at every turn. Some of the Egyptian collection was quite literally brought into the sun by a new cage-like construction designed by Chipperfield. The way the new inserts itself within the old is surprising. Because you're always aware that there are new acts in the building, but not in a way that is, let's say, contradictory with what is old. Somehow the old seems bigger, more alive, and actually richer with David's intervention. And that richness is very appealing. The decoration had been lost in many places, so in places where we lost it completely, we faked the, the grid again. We just did that as an impression. So you got a sense of pattern. Every single square inch of that building is denoted on a drawing like this. And for me, it's one of those drawings that links, that really tells you what architects do. And, you know, I, I get really excited to see this because it's as authored as the napkin sketch. This is as much what David is as the kind of little doodle. You know, this is really the work of David Chipford Architects. And that kind of ruin was, was you know, a problem. I mean, it was, it was a really big problem. No one knew what to do with it. No one knew how to handle its kind of neoclassical heritage or its GDR heritage or its Second World War heritage or, you know, all of those things were impossible to, to deal with. Uh, there was a desire for, by the client to have a much flashier, much more kind of 21st century looking building. Renowned American architect Frank Gehry was Chipperfield's chief rival in the architectural competition for the project. The process was tortuous and the presentations took place in this room. As a young architect, I had the drawings pinned on the wall and the general director, who would want to Geary, after about five minutes, stood up, came to my drawings, hit them and said, this is shit. I do not need this. This is shit. Really? My God. This is absolute shit. And walked out. And I was like five minutes and there was like 30 people there. I said, so now what do I do? And I just thought, like, the most important person in the jury has just left the room. Then we got a phone call after saying that we've decided 
to do a second round with you and Geary. So congratulations, you're through to... So <laughs> we were given another two months and it was head to head. And in fact, recently someone said to me, well, you know, during high noon, I said, what's high noon? You know, when you and Geary were, <laughs> it became a sort of, it was- So you were in, on the same day? Were yeah, I mean, we didn't, no. literally. Uh, and um, so we presented and by that time, and at the end of the presentation, Duba came up to me and said, fantastic. What happened in the interim? Then? But there, I mean, you can't, I mean, in England, you don't talk to each other for 20 years. That's also where I got my CBE in that room. Oh, really? So in the very Delivered. room where you were humiliated. And <laughs> it's everything <laughs> is happening. Yeah. But from the Queen personally. <laughs> yes. And as if that wasn't enough, Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall came for a personal tour. And so did the most powerful woman in Europe, rumoured to be David Chipperfield's newest and biggest fan, the President of the German Republic, Angela Merkel. It does have a very special character. And even as I walk around today, there are certain sorts of things. The fall of the light in the Western sun is fantastic. And the discovery of tiny little things which happen is going to keep me going there <laughs> for a very long time. Every decision had to be formulated by us, then had to be proposed by us, then had to be approved by the user group and the delivery agency. I felt it could have stayed empty because the building as such was so extraordinary. It was such an incredible document of history and of taste and of all these everything that happened to this city over... Yes, what a great narrative. Uh, yeah, it was, the story tomorrow. was all there. And it, it almost seemed a waste to put it full of art. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying that when he went to the Norris Museum, that it seemed a waste to put any art in it because the narrative and the story was so rich. I know, so I he didn't need all it. the art in there. We better cut that out. Can we cut that out? No, what? Makes it even richer. It is a mess, Berlin, but it's a nice mess, no? The success of the Neues Museum has led to an even more ambitious role for David Chipperfield in the future of the city he loves. He's now responsible for the master plan for Museum Island in the heart of Berlin. It began as King Friedrich Wilhelm's romantic sketch for a sanctuary of art and science in 1841. Prince Charles would definitely approve. Admittedly, he couldn't have predicted that a railway would run through the middle of it. The long-term timescale of this city plan is unbelievably rare in architecture these days. In England, you have discussion about planning things about three years ahead or something, maximum. Here, you're in meetings and it says, well, if we open the South Wing in 2019, we could do the... North Wing 2024, it means that we could bring the connection to, you know, and you're sitting in this room and you're saying, <laughs> you're thinking, will I still be here? Whatever the future brings, Chipperfield has already made his mark. That's a Chipperfield building. And so is this a townhouse art gallery on a prize site that rather playfully seems to both fit in and stand out at the same time. Those windows are really tall. So this is our corner of Berlin. It's a ringside seat for the main event, a view of the Neues Museum. But even that is changing as another Chipperfield building rises from the construction site opposite. It's a new gallery and a grand public entrance to Museum Island. So what this building does is add a whole lot of facilities that the Museum Island doesn't have. And then 
it sort of helps bind together all the buildings. So it's both familiar and unfamiliar. You know, it's somehow both. It actually has the illusion of being quite historical in a way, so but actually I mean? it's extremely minimal and modern. You know, it's going to be heroic. <laughs> it's not. It's not as soft as people might think it might be. It's going to be a little bit shocking. Chipperfield's vision in columns and glass is a bold one, and it's inspired by a monumental work of modernism by his great hero, the German-born architect Mies van der Rohe. It's a building which plays an important role in the story of West Berlin. Once the city was divided, of course, the West had lost, you know, its, all its museums. So then they had to build these alternative institutions. And a rather strange place to build it, in a way, because, the set, you know, so this new centre, cultural centre, was not in the centre of the West, but as close to the wall as possible. Provocatively, in a way, reminding people just over there how good it was over here. It's a strange moment when a temple of modernism begins to show its age. Chipperfield has won the job of refurbishing it. You can just see the level of trust that the German people have in David to feel comfortable to let him deal with this masterpiece of Mies van der Rohe's. It's a unique opportunity to get forensically close to the work of the man who famously pronounced that less is more and that God is in the detail. The roof was built as a plate on the floor and as it went up, the, the legs just swung in. And then no one had done something like that before. Was he on the site when this was all done? Well, he came to see the, the lifting of the roof and he, I think, as an act of bravado, went underneath the roof to prove how no. Do you do things like that yourself? No, no, no. Hello. Restoring a Mies building is not going to be easy. Every element, every joint is part of the architecture. Even its plan has a graphic purity. This is a formidable drawing of Mies van der Rohe's Neue National Gallery in Berlin. And it's a reflected ceiling plan showing that extraordinary grid within a grid within a grid of, of um, the kind of Mies van der Rohe module of this square temple in the center of, of Berlin. I must say, for me, it's kind of one of those moments where the apprentice meets the master. This is a glass and steel building. It's also a gallery in which mm -hmm. art has to be exhibited. I mean, most people would say, well, most galleries, they have hardly any light coming in. This is all about light. How do you deal with that in relation to your responsibility towards what comes in here? And how are you, are you thinking hard about that? Mies was challenged early on, you know, that that uh, this was going to be a problem. And he amusingly said, I know, but I think it was, it's such an interesting concept, I feel obliged to pursue it. <laughs> Which I think is a good line. Yes. It's a good line yes. to use against your clients, but I'm not sure we could ever do that ourselves. Mies had this sort of idea about how you would do it. So he hung panels in here, and you walked in and it sort of worked. Now the building has an authority and, and it, somehow it's part of nature, it's part of the city, and everyone recognizes that this is the great room of Berlin. But you can see that simple things over the years have just gradually eroded the quality. I mean, one of the biggest problems has been the glass. I would say th this architecture forgives Nothing. That's not, yeah. Forgives nothing. Anything, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, because, uh, I mean, this is... God is in the detail. Yeah, uh, and, of course, this is a very, you know, minimal building, obviously, in yeah. that sense. So every single... You, you've got very few materials you're using, uh -huh. and they've got to be... It's got to be right. This materiality is fundamental, but it's, it's full of weaknesses in terms of how we now would build up an isolation between inside and outside. So, great sheets of condensation form on the inside of this building. And they even anticipated that moisture, because yeah. this is like a rain, this is like a gutter. We're going to spend a lot of money restoring this building. So therefore, if we're going to restore it, surely we're going to solve all the problems, the technical problems that the building carries. Otherwise, why would you spend that money? On the other hand, 
we're restoring Mies. So surely if you're going to restore Mies, you're going to restore Mies. What's you have the to point? Be true to Mies. What's so. the point of killing Mies in, in protecting him? So you actually have to have a cross-cultural dialogue. You know, in England, I think we would just get, it would get project managed out of yeah, the story. and they would like, say, I'm sorry, that's costing yeah. that much more. And no you know, one's going to tell the difference. Know, we've we're going we've to talked it. about this enough. You know, we've had two meetings and we've just got to make a decision. In Germany, you can have 20 meetings, you can have 40 meetings, it doesn't matter. But you do, don't you? <laughs> yeah, you do, until you get it right. How many meetings have there been about the carpet? Uh, quite a few. The <laughs> carpet's not over. The carpet's no, not over? Okay. Still... <laughs> Mies had nothing to do with this. No, no, no. no. Of course. He chose this. This is a sacred liner. Hello. 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 He didn't just sort of say, you go through that door and it's all rubbish in there, and I'm, I'm not interested. I mean, this is really carefully thought through furniture. And the table, which the is... The table, is, that, that's is, a Mies table too. Yeah. Well, it's half of it. Half of Mies table. They were too big. God, that, that's the most shocking thing you've said today. <laughs> the Mies table was cut in half. Look how beautiful that is. He did love the way to build. I mean, he was absolutely interested in, in uh, construction, not image. I mean, you know, the problem about architecture now is that we've, we've become more interested in the virtual than we are in the, the, the experiential. And the problem is that a lot of architecture is known through image anyway. Well, it's an interesting point that we never talk about with architecture, which is how a building feels. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. not, not a... a absolutely. A, very so, difficult to discuss. No, but the, and yet, it's that what it that's what it's about. Yeah, How does the building feel? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Absolutely. The last exhibition in the new National Gallery, a prologue to renovation, was this installation by Chipperfield himself, a play on the history of the column called Sticks and Stones. It's no accident today that he makes the core of his practice in cultural buildings and he does them brilliantly. He understands how artists want to work, he understands how curators want to work. He never seems to do a bad one when it comes to museums and galleries. And of course those have become the kind of cathedrals of our time. I think David's work is always conceived in response to the nature of the place in which it sits. Something like Hepworth. It sort of almost adopts the River Calder as a moat with a bridge running across and uh, it has these steep concrete walls with kind of quite minimal kind of fenestration. What was so interesting about the site that we were given uh, is that it's com it was, in my opinion, completely three-dimensional. And of course, that brought me into a sort of nervous moment of architecture sculpture, which I'm, I am very nervous and I sort of, but instead of just sort of putting a shape on top of something, I was interested in the idea of articulating the rooms of a museum and extending those, extrapolating out of those rooms form. And the light is quite important, isn't it? Where the light's coming into this space. Well, that was the other part of this little jigsaw puzzle, that to bring light in through a roof in an even way onto, onto an art space is quite complex. And by the time it gets to the wall plane, to the picture plane, it's sort of fizzled out a bit. So this was a strategy of not bringing real light onto the wall, onto the floor, but in a way like church light, I called it church light, mm -hmm. you know, that it was that connection to, to daylight that reminded you of the weather and the fact that you were in a room. Making architecture for art is a very specific task because it's not about how you live, it's not about your daily life, it's about a visit. And it's a completely different set of critical elements between the viewer and the artwork. It's an architecture which must step back and let the artwork come forward. 
And Hapwith does it incredibly well and yet manages to be the closest thing, one might say, to an iconic building that David has done. But Wakefield needed a building that had presence in that way. One of the questions that, you know, remains out there, you know, can we only find architecture now in museums? I mean, I'm, you know, I am very self-conscious that we are in a sort of green zone in doing museum architecture because you are privileged generally to be in an environment where everyone's roughly going in the same direction. There are no explicit enemies. Um, at the same time, being an architect out there, outside of the green zone, um, uh, in the commercial world, it's become increasingly difficult and architecture has become increasingly isolated. Buildings have become isolated from the fabric of the city. Um, they don't just replace, you know, you don't take one building down, replace it with something roughly the same size and slot it back in. You take ten buildings down and build a tower. When I was director of the Venice Biennale, my, my theme was, you know, common ground and of course I was lamenting the lack of common ground between society and the profession. At first glance, this unassuming seaside village in a corner of Spain is the last place you'd expect a world-renowned architect to build a home. Initially, it was just the family's holidays, then extended a bit, and then gradually the, the opportunity arose to build a house there, to invite people, and actually we have meetings there as much as he has his holidays. That annual break, which isn't really a break because he invites the world to come and join him, um, and indeed see things his way, I mean, there's the beauty of this natural environment, but also it's a kind of quite ordinary, you could, some people might say even it's a quite ugly town. I think you can use the word ugly. Can I? Uh, so what brought you here? I mean, it started off for us really innocently as, you know, trying to work out where to take the kids in the summer for a few weeks. And it, it grew into something else. To be in a place of such incredible natural beauty, and the people who actually, I have to say, have, have understood better and better that they have a deep love of the place, a deep love of the place. You know, there's something very content by that. To, and that's something which I think societally we're, we've sort of lost, you know, that globalization is always one, you know, it puts us in a situation where we always want to be somewhere else. And what has been the great experience here is that We've tried to, you know, we found a place to be. We've tried to um, be part of it. You have a kind of quite benign view of what people do to their own homes, right? Typical Galician village was granite, granite, granite. Then they added. They stuck tiles on things, and you know, they added areas. And that might cheer you up. <laughs> one person does it, and then the next one decides to copy it. <clears throat> and this has got a 3D print on it. I wouldn't be at all surprised in another 10 years you know, because underneath that is real stone like that. So they, they've just layered that. They're just to... layers on top. <laughs> at least, at least it is a sort of engagement. What'd she say to you? 
She said it's a very pretty village and very tranquil and nice to be in. No, but it, it you know, it's, there's something pleasant about there it. There is, there's something you charming know. about it. And so, everywhere you go, something hits you by surprise. <laughs> yeah, it's full of text, it's full of life, it's full of, you know, and is, is a lot of it ugly? Yeah, sure. But the problem with design and architecture, and especially now, it takes itself too seriously. And in the end, you've got to remember what it's, what it's for. It's about people. It's not, it's, not, it's not that important. And here we are, actually. This is, this is your home. There was a gap in the village. And it's a really strange gap. And you can see that the street turns. All the buildings stick out in a funny way. So I didn't know how to design a house that fitted into this strange geometry. It's very inspired by Alvaro Cesar, who's, who's right houses. by the traffic lights. The only Actually. traffic lights in town. So you going? Yes. It's actually quite a small house. So how does he manage to get so many people into it? Space, light, and the right materials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is... So that's the view. That is quite something. It is interesting. Villagers will come in here and then they stand and look at the view all the time and say, wow, it's a fantastic view. And you say, well, yeah, but you've always had it. But there's something about framing a view or, you know, intensifying something. And I think that's something which is you know, interest me is the idea of you know, making ordinary things more special. There's no hiding in a house. It's like trying to write a poem rather than a novel, because a novel is a big baggy thing which can allow all sorts of things to happen. But the house is a way to develop ideas with great clarity, and they all show you can't bluff with a house. He wants to make a building that resonates with your life. In that sense, he's a space doctor. He knows that life is messy, but he likes to make very beautiful cupboards to put the mess away in. We shouldn't leave Evelyn out of this, because together they've become an extraordinary team. Hi, Manolo. Manolo, what happened with Manolo? She's so, I think, emotionally intelligent, and Evelyn's interest in you know, the human relations within the Chipperfield practice has been absolutely intrinsic to its success. This house, the space that you created, that he's created, it's quite small, isn't it? Well, it was a tiny little triangle in the village, and the neighbor wanted it for his car. And I think the only reason why the man who owned it sold it to us is because he started to worry that this neighbor who he really disliked intensely would actually get it for his car. So he sold it to us, and it did look like a triangle, like something that nobody could do anything with. And I suppose I have a good architect. I sense about David that somehow, despite what, d despite his passion for architecture, I think sometimes I feel he's disappointed with what architecture is achieving. With Disappointment it. is not a word that I would associate with him. He's never a victim. You know, he's always he always feels huge responsibility for doing something in the way in which he feels it could be done or at least attempting to. I mean, he never feels it's done well enough. I mean, that, that is sometimes nerve-wracking. I mean, he always, you know, to say not bad is the height of, the height of, of, of praise. So what would David be if he, if he wasn't an architect? What would be the thing that would give him 
God. satisfaction and pleasure. I think he probably would do anything, you know, anything in, in a very similar way. He's often said he'd love to be a chef. Apparently before he was an architect, he thought of being a vet, which I can't imagine at all. He'd love to write novels. <laughs> but I think he likes to be an architect. David sailing can be a metaphor for a man that has sailed his own course with a distant horizon. He was never one for short gains. David became fanatic over the years about sailing. The whole family did, and it's sort of great, you know, he takes people on the big boat. The children grew up sailing here, and then so I had to, you know, try and keep up with them. So I learned sailing at the same time as they did. Of course, they're natural sailors, and I'm not. So they, you know, I can't really sail without them. You know, we do it as a family. Essentially, what we do here is to swap our anxieties from, you know, the abstract ones to the physical ones to the real ones. But then people say to me, yeah, but why do you have 18 people for, in your house? And why do you bring all these people? I mean, there's, you know, we have some 150 people over this house. It's some ridiculous <laughs> number. For me, that's the other aspect, that it's not, the world isn't just the physical. It's also sitting down with people and, you know, communing and enjoying that. I mean, these, are, these sound terribly cliched ideas. Gabriel tells me that when you designed this kitchen, you were obsessive and fanatical about every single thing in this kitchen. If you're using something all the time, and I know how to use it, and I know the problems with it, when I redesigned it, I tried to solve all the issues that were there before. The dishwasher used to be this side, so people used to come and empty it. So I tried to keep a barrier here. I think unlike quite a lot of architects, you absolutely believe that it is a collaboration, and it's a collaboration with the environment, with the... Because I just, A, I just don't like fighting. I'm not confrontational, and therefore I find that difficult. And secondly, I think, instead of you there and me there, we should both be looking at the same thing. Yeah. You want everybody to, you know, if that's, if that's the problem and that's the issue, we should all be looking at it. Sort of a white cut, it's quite a modern brick. It's concrete. Yeah, exactly. So you've not really chosen to reference the brick in any way. What well, if you use the brick of the building, it, no one's, you're not going to convince anybody that that piece right. is part of the original building. It seems that for Chipperfield, the conversation really never stops. So you had the bridge, and the, and the bridge comes. How do you actually get through that? So we bring this floor lower to the same level of this cast corridor. If we take all of this back of house stuff away, take away all of this crap, and it will become a rather beautiful introduction and another dimension to Royal Academy. And it will open in our 250th anniversary, which is 2018. The new master plan will bring all the buildings of a Royal Academy together, along with the tribes that inhabit them, the curators, the art handlers, the students, the academicians, and they've all got a point of view. This conversation has been going on for seven years. And if that's not enough of a challenge, this could well be. David Chipperfield comes to New York every month to meet with his clients at the Met, led by its director, Thomas Campbell. For the Met in New York, perhaps the most well-endowed museum on the planet, to choose an architect from London is a fantastic achievement. It has to be the moment when David can finally relax. He's made it. Well, maybe. You know, going round and round this building, you know, why one likes so much of the Fifth Avenue side of the building and other parts is that you get the feeling that the architecture is somehow part of the gallery spaces. Why 
modern contemporary is so disappointing is that you feel you're in the world of drywall and paneling. You don't feel that there's anything there that wouldn't just be blown away by a strong wind. Things don't feel like they're on purpose. No, exactly. And there's a sort of, there's a competition rather than a reinforcement. Yeah. The Met extension is a big deal. It involves demolishing the whole modern and contemporary wing, designed in the 1980s by Kevin Roche and partners. What Roche did was just kind of, boom, bang something very new against something old and say, talk to each other. But they never really did talk to each other very well. So my hope is that what David Chipperfield does is in this kind of newer tradition of juxtaposing modern and traditional architecture in a way that actually encourages them to speak rather than having them sort of stare at each other and not talking. Conventionally, you put the desk there, the coat check, and all that stuff. The stakes are high, and New York cultural politics oh, okay. is a tough game. A lot of people will need persuading. That is David's vision, under the drape. But we're not allowed to show the model. The Met will need to tread carefully. This is sensitive ground. David. Two major New York institutions have recently had to abandon expansion plans because of public opposition. David, let me take a snapshot. An Instagram moment. Of you. <laughs> this is extraordinary, huh? What you're getting here is not only the New York skyline, but the Met is known as the only building in Central Park. Everybody always wanted the museum and the park to connect better. Maybe now it can happen. And if it's better than what we see there now, I would expect and in fact hope that the public response would be positive. But all of that said, you know, in New York, you really can't predict anything. It is a bit strange to knock down a building that isn't so old. I mean, the people in the museum remember the opening. Tableware is designed by Chipperfield for the Italian design house, Alessi. And have you noticed no computers, only models, and they are everywhere? The physical model in our office remains the tool of exploration and communication. I will only look at projects through physical models because I think it, it, it gives us something to talk about as a third person. This is the Met. The project is that we, t we take this away, even though it was built in the 80s, uh, and build a new, a new building. And so you can see all of these different iterations which have been going on through the competition stage of nearly a year and now we're in the uh, concept stage again of developing a, the project. So, so even though they, they commissioned you, that dialogue continues with the... With the yeah, board. it starts again. Since we've become much more digital in every aspect of life, I think this physical presence of buildings has a lot more power. In David's buildings, there's rarely a single image. Other than to make it a more civilized place. Sir David Chipperfield, CBE, Royal Gold Medalist, Sterling Prize winner, is among the most admired and sought after architects in the world. Earlier this year, he was chosen to design a new contemporary wing for that temple of culture, New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Commissions don't come more prestigious than this. What's more, the new building will replace the current galleries, which face onto the hallowed ground of Central Park. He's come a long way from the frock shop in Sloan Street, which began his career. To visit David Chipperfield in his office, you ascend a slightly tatty 60s office block from a windswept corner next to Waterloo Station. This is how you might imagine an architect's office should be. Space and light, tables for meeting and eating, where even the table...
that will be remembered long into the future. I don't know any architect who hasn't been to the Neues Museum and felt it was a masterpiece. To spend 11 years on a museum in Berlin, to go through the drudgery, the bureaucracy, the sense that everyone is trying to stop what you're doing, to go through all that and still keep an idea alive, that is a remarkable achievement. When you walk around them, you think, but this is the work of, of madmen for a whole century, you know, <laughs> including the architect. And I just think that's so powerful. I mean, it changes you going to that building. Chipperfield is one of the few architects in the world who can create a cocktail of conservative, almost a classicism, and a very crisp modernism. I think he's trying to cultivate a conversation, not just within the office, but within a wider society. He's a very articulate architect. The work begins with words, in a way. But he lets beautiful materials, great spaces, and light do the talking for him. I don't think he's trying to change the world. Isles stacked into 352 meters of shelving. These are from a pre-digital world. Every plan, purchase order, design decision placed on paper. Over a million pages, of which nearly 400,000 are letters and faxes. It's a paper trail from an epic process, a single architectural project. There is human drama here, conflict and collaboration. A discussion about a staircase that went on for over a year. The name on the files is David Chipperfield. The project is the Neues Museum in Berlin. Few buildings are more symbolic of the history of Germany in the last century, but its restoration has transformed it into something more powerful, more affecting than anyone could have imagined. A new building created from the remains of the old, a fusion of past and present, and a moment in architecture. It's more complex. Um, it's not a one-liner. I think David Sheffield buildings don't come and grab you. You have to sort of enter into his world to get it. I've seen it happen before. And a month down, I said, but why was that stair there? Well, it's, I thought it had to be there. Just got to be careful that it doesn't become a wrong piece of information. So this is your eagle's nest here. You're surrounded by the London that you, well, I won't say, what, the London that you what? Well, there is, a, there is something sobering when you sit here and you discuss architecture and you stress about a staircase or a plan or something small and then you lift your head up and you look at that and you think what's the important thing is designing a, a staircase have any relevance compared to designing a city you know i mean what's architecture for that's my worry. What, what, what are we doing as a...